Hey there, here are the disclaimers. Please enjoy. There is a man that follows me. I sit in a cafe, typing at my laptop as I sip the final dregs of my iced coffee. I look up, gazing over the top of the screen to the seat opposite me. He's sitting there. He wasn't sitting there before, but I'm not surprised to see him. He vanishes from time to time. There was a blissful period when he didn't appear for an entire weekend. Still, even when he's not visible, I know that he's always around, watching, waiting. Hi! What's up? He's a young man, dressed in sharp, crisp clothes. Some might even call him handsome. He crosses one leg over the other and leans back, enjoying the aroma of his espresso before taking a sip. He never takes his eyes off of me. I focus my gaze on the laptop screen, trying to avoid looking at his face. I was in the middle of typing a sentence, but I can't remember for... I can't remember the continuation. For a moment, I stare blankly at the document, typing, deleting, and retyping the same word over and over, as a cold, prickling sensation watches over me. Well, washes over me. The man finally speaks. His voice is calm, but reassured. He talks with the quiet confidence of a university professor. This is a nice cafe, isn't it? It's your favorite. It's cozy and quiet, and the coffee is good. It's not too expensive either. Oh my god, his voice is sending me holy frick! I don't respond. The man continues to chat. All of the employees are kind. They're generous allowing students to work here for so long. Though, you've already been here for 30 minutes. It was fairly empty when you first arrived, but it's going to be crowded soon. People always drop by to kill time before their evening classes. Don't you think it's about time to leave? I mean, I would go anywhere you want to go. <laughs> I, I have a drink. The man pick up picks up the plastic cup and shakes it, rattling the ice cubes. He cocks his head and looks at me, raising an eyebrow. You had a drink. I'm thinking about getting some food, maybe a pastry or a bagel. Are you? Really? When you're trying to save money, and you have sandwich fixings at home? I slump down, leaning my face closer to the screen as I mash the keys, filling the document with gibberish, only tangentially related to the topic on the paper. The man sighs. The employees are too kind. They won't tell you to leave, even if you're being a bother. You're a paying customer, after all. A paying customer that sat here for 30 minutes after getting a single coffee and insists on taking up an entire two-person table for just one person. Oh my god. God, like it did. Oh my God! The the way he says this, I know that he's insulting me, but God, I am feeling things which I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to be feeling. Holy frick! Let's go home, okay? One minute later, and I'm tossing my cup in the recycling. I open the door to the cafe. The cold wind outside buffets my face, and chilly droplets sting my skin. Hmm. As I head back to my dorm, the man walks alongside me, a satisfied and jaunty spring in his step. He tries to hold my bag, but I refuse. As he strolls along, he hums merrily. He even reaches out to hold my hand, interlacing his fingers with mine, but I shrug my hand out of his grasp. The drizzle begins to turn into a shower. The man's mood doesn't dampen. He jogs alongside me at, at an easy pace as I sprint home, shivering as the rain soaks through my clothes. When I unlock the door, the man waits to the side, still watching my face closely. Droplets of water fall from the hair framing his sunny expression. Before I go inside, he pulls my sleeve and lends a kiss on my cheek. I was so happy to spend this time with you. I'll see you again soon. Uh, 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 he walks away. When I poke my head into the hallway, he was already... He, he's already vanished. 
Huh. I'm surprised. Usually he follows me inside. He lingers, preparing tea and snacks and soothing music. Then after an hour or two, he disappears. I'm always glad when he's gone. That man wasn't always there. I can't remember seeing him when I was in elementary school. Perhaps he was lingering somewhere, watching, but he never came to talk to me. The first time I met him was in middle school, right after the school play. As I huddled backstage, frantically rehearsing my lines, I saw him for the first time. I gazed up to see a boy, kneeling beside me. He looked so different at that time. He was younger, and he wore a simple collared shirt and a pair of jeans. I thought that he might have been a classmate, but I didn't recognize him. At first, I thought he was strange, but I tried to ignore him. Instead, I focused on the crumpled sheet of printer paper, repeating the words until they rolled off the tongue. Then he spoke. There are so many people watching. Can you imagine what it would be like if you forgot your lines? You're standing on stage in front of dozens of people, flapping your mouth like a dying fish. I wonder what your classmates would think. They'd probably curse you for ruining weeks of hard work, for being the only wrench in a well-oiled machine. Oh well, I hope that doesn't happen. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? Half an hour later, as I stood on stage in front of dozens of parents, my mind went blank. I forgot my lines. I choked, tears stinging the corners of my eyes. As I looked around the auditorium, I, th I saw the stranger standing at the back, arms crossed as he leaned against the wall. I couldn't tell if he looked sympathetic or elated. As I walked home, he found me again, skipping alongside me. He held my hand and smiled. I screamed at him. I pushed him away and ran. When he was out of sight, I looked at my palm. He had given me some chocolate. Since then, I've seen the stranger countless times. He appears anywhere. When I'm walking around outside, when I'm shopping, when I'm in class... The only place that offers me some semblance of refuge is my room, although he still sneaks in there sometimes, invading even my most private of spaces. I don't know his name. I call him Geist. As in Poltergeist? Ugh. I lean over my keyboard and groan. No matter what I try, the program won't output the correct answer. After over an hour of tinkering, the result is the same. I look at the clock at the bottom left of the screen, 7.03 p.m. If I recall correctly, there should be a computer science tutoring scheduled from 7 to 9 tonight. My fingers twist in my shirt. I've never gone to tutoring before. But the assignment is due at 11 p.m. I bite my lip, staring hard at the code, hoping that some solution will magically appear in my brain. It doesn't. The clock changes, 7.04 p.m. I stand. I can do this. The alternative is missing the assignment and getting a zero after all. Besides, who goes to tutoring? There probably won't be anyone there. Hmm. I was wrong. But I'm standing outside the door, my resolve falters. I peer in through the shades covering the window. There are quite a few people inside. At least ten. A familiar, cold hand lands on my shoulder. Geist smiles at me, his expression twisted into something resembling sympathy. So many people. <sighs> Better not go in. Let's go home. I'm sure that you can figure it out. You know, I'm starting to wonder if the VA for this is like an ASMR artist of some sort, because like... The, the way that they're actually speaking into the mic, it, it it's given me shivers, and I'm I know that's the effect that they were going for, but... I, I, I'm just curious about that. I, I'm definitely looking it up later. Is the room not open? I turn. Oh, hey there. You bundle of sunshine? Hi. A boy with a white smile and warm brown eyes is standing behind me. I recognize him. His sky blue Hawaiian shirt decorated with plumeria says difficult to forget. We're in the same lecture. He always sits in the front row. Ah, uh, uh. Oh. I got it. No key card, right? I got you. He maneuvers around me and swipes a card through the ID reader. 
when it clicks, he swings the door open and holds it for me. After you. I take a deep breath and go in. Huh. The room is surprisingly crowded. Probably because the problem set is due tonight. Several small groups of students are huddled over their laptops in different areas of the room, scrutinizing their screens. A couple stragglers are hunched over the university desktops, typing furiously. There seems to be a single tutor, a pale Japanese guy. He has messy dyed hair, and he's wearing a Tricone University letterman's jacket. He is leaning on the desk next to one of the stragglers, pointing to the screen as he explains something. I go to a corner of the room and sit between two of the computers. I take out my laptop, rousing it from its slumber and navigating to my code editor. Guy settles into the chair next to me, crossing one leg over the other. The boy also sits next to me, on the opposite side. He leaves a one computer gap between us. My heartbeat hitches. Is he going to try to talk to me? I just came to get some help with my homework. I'm not ready to make small talk with a stranger. To my relief, the boy just takes out his laptop and starts typing. Any help? The tutor walks over. His icy eyes flit between us before settling on the boy. The boy gestures to me with both hands. Oh, um, that person was here first. Look at you, troubling him. You wouldn't even have come in if he didn't hold the door for you. Let's hope you can talk without tripping over your own tongue like a buffoon. My cheeks heat up. I frantically click through my pages of web searches, hoping that the tutor doesn't see my open tabs or my bookmarks. Finally, I pull the code editor back up. I'm running into an error, and I can't figure it out. The tutor peruses my screen. It takes him less than two seconds to spot the issue. Easy one. Here. You've got a less than or equal sign. It should be less than. I make the correction. The tutor waits as I run the program. He directs me through a couple of tests. When he verifies that the code is working as intended, he turns to the boy. All right, what about you? <laughs> if I'm being honest, I don't really know where to start. The tutor raises an eyebrow and grabs a chair next to the boy, making himself comfortable. Let's see. Oh, the palindrome problem. For this one, you need to make a recursive function. I return to my own homework. My brain is particularly slow today, my fingers stumbling over the keys. For some reason, I can't seem to focus on the assignment. 20 minutes pass, and I'm still working on the same problem. Guy leans back on his chair as he reads a novel. The bell jar is emblazoned in elegant, curved letters on the cover. You can't focus because there are too many people here. What if they're all looking at you, seeing how horribly slow you are? Why are you even in this class when you're so terrible at coding? My mouth tightens into a skull. Next to me, the tutor has been hovering by the boy the entire time, guiding his charge methodically through the prom. However, it's slow going. Several sheets of paper cover the, covered with scrawled diagrams are lying on the desk, but the boy's eyebrows are still furrowed in confusion. The older student sighs, glancing at the other students in the room. I'll be back. Let me help them for a sec. The boy nods in understanding. Guys claps his book shut, demanding my attention. Why don't we go home? You got what you came for. We can finish in peace and quiet at the dorms. I grit my teeth. I want to stuff Guy's book down his throat, but then I hear something weird. The boy is making a strange, pitiful sound in his throat. He sounds kind of like a whining puppy. He stares at the computer in dejection. His frown so deep that it looks like a rain cloud crossed over his face. I eye his screen. Every time he runs his program, it freezes, refusing to budge until he force closes it. I look a little closer. Oh, he forgot to increment the counter variable. Should I say something? It's easy enough to fix, but my throat feels dry. Mm, you'd better not. Can you really explain yourself clearly? You're just going to make him more confused. Oh my god. <laughs> 
<laughs> like, I know that I want to help the dude, but at the same time, like, oh my god. Okay, this is what we're gonna do, okay? So there are two routes in this visual novel. Okay, two endings you could go through. One is Guy's route, and the other one is, like, the other dude's route. I forgot what's his name. Uh, we're gonna go down Guy's route first, uh, before we actually, um, before we actually go for the other ending. But anyway. Besides, he didn't ask for your help. Why do you want to stick your nose somewhere it doesn't belong? If anything, he'll think you're a creep who's spying on him. A guy's voice squeezes my vocal cords. It's difficult to breathe, let alone speak. Ah, uh, what the heck? I'm gonna save. Save the game. Ooh, okay. Uh, just save the game, and I'm going to stay silent. I purse my lips and return my attention to my own homework. I type away for a few minutes, writing a series of loops. Um, excuse me. My heart rate spikes, and my shoulders hunch as if swinging on a rusty hinge. My head turns slowly to look at the boy sitting next to me. Really sorry to bother you, but would you mind taking a look at this? My coat keeps freezing and uh, I can't figure it out. Oh, I need to look like a puppy! <laughs> I scoot my chair over and he makes room for me. I pretend to study his screen. There, you didn't increment your counter variable, so the loop never stops. The loop never stops running. Ah, uh, so that's what it was. <laughs> he types the correction and runs the program. It runs without freezing, even though it doesn't output the correct answer. You saved me. Oh, thank you. Uh, what's your name? I'm Clay. For a second there, I thought they were gonna hit me with uh, some Dixon Dallas. <laughs> God, the music just sounded that way. I'm Lion. Nice to meet you. We're in the same lecture, right? I'm pretty sure I've seen you around. I nod my head, my eyes inadvertently skirt around his face, avoiding direct contact. We return to our respective problem sets. Once or twice he reaches out to me with a question or asks me what problem I'm working on. Every time he opens his mouth, my stomach does a backflip. Slowly, the other students file out of the room. Soon, Kale and I are the only ones left. The door opens. A female student hovers in the doorway. She's dark-skinned. Her umber hair falls in coils, framing her face. She's wearing a bright blue Tricone University sweatshirt, a pair of dark wash jeans, and a white backpack. When she sees Kale and me, her eyes widen in surprise. She talks to the tutor, letting the door close behind her. Oh, are you still busy? Ah, uh, yeah. Take your time. I'll be over here. Kale's eyes widen, and he waves enthusiastically as the older student. She smiles and waves back. The older student goes to the other side of the room and sits in a chair. She slings her backpack over the back of the seat before taking a book out of her bag and starting to read. Do you know her? Yeah. She's a TA from one of my other classes. Super nice and so smart. She gave me a lot of advice about the courses and teachers in the bio department. I eye the clock. 9.15 p.m. I've been here way too long. The tutor is only paid to stay on the clock until 9. I start to pack my things. I'm not done, but I'll have to finish it up somewhere else. Next to me. Kale seems to have the same idea. I thank the ICI'd upperclassman and... Exit the computer lab. I check my phone again. 9.20 p.m. now. I still have an hour and a half to finish and submit. I should go to the library. I can't waste valuable time walking back to my dorm. Before I have the chance to put on my headphones, Kale jogs up beside me, his backpack bouncing on his shoulder. I instinctively tense up. Hey, you still get some homework to do, right? Do you want to work on it together? Ah, uh, um, okay. I'm so taken aback that I can't even think to refuse. He beams. Shoots! Comrades until 11. Gee, it's done. <laughs> Kali and I both slump on the table, relieved. 10.52 p.m. We submitted our assignments just in time. Thanks for doing it with me. I don't know what I would have done without you. I can't resist smiling, hoping that I don't look overly awkward. It was fun. Well, as fun as doing homework could be. Kale is easy to talk to and jokes around a bit while still taking his work seriously. 
Coding didn't come easily to him initially, but once things start to click, he began to breeze through the problems much more easily. I was worried that it would be a one-sided affair, but he ended up helping me as much as I helped him. As I close out of my coding editor, I side-eye the blonde man sitting next to me. To my surprise, Geist is silent as a mouse. When we were finishing our homework, I noticed him glaring at the two of us over the top of the bell jar, but the blonde man didn't say a word. Even now, no venomous quips escapes his lips. He just stares at Kali, a face twisted in an expression of vague irritation. Ah, oh, it's this late? Oh, gotta go. Early morning tomorrow. See you in class. He smiles as he waves goodbye. After he leaves, my chest feels light. Sometimes good things do happen, even to people like me. Sometimes the sun does come, even to a place where it's always raining. I have to keep myself from humming as I pack up my own belongings. When I exit the library, the air is chilly, nipping at my nose and cheeks. It's completely dark and mostly empty, the lamps casting eerie pools of light over the main plaza. As I go down the library steps, Guys follows me a step behind, matching my every stride. I steer my gaze ahead, trying to ignore him. I take my headphones from around my neck and snap them over my ears. A welcome shield from the cold. I take up my phone and select my listening material of choice. Ooh, soothing music, a podcast, exciting music, an audiobook. You know what? I want to listen to Distractable. I, 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 I've not listened to Distractable in a while. I'll, I'll admit to that. I mean, I would be listening to like Poison and uh, some of the other, some of the other songs which I've been repeating far too often. Uh, but you know what? Let's let's listen to Distractable. I open up my favorite podcast. The two, three holes start to ramble about the history of cheese, drowning out the world. I turn towards the path leading down to my dorm, but something catches my eye. Someone's waving at me. A girl wearing a white hoodie, her hair tossed into a loose bun. I recognize her, although I don't know her name. We're in the same classic seminar. What should I do? Should I wave? Should I pretend that I don't see her and walk past? Bah, well, where, well, where do, does this matter? Apparently, this does matter, oddly enough, even though, like, uh, Kale isn't around, so I'm not gonna wave, no. I lower my eyes, pulling my headphones tighter over my ears. I don't see anything, I don't hear anything. Eventually, she skips past me, greeting a girl jogging out of the library. I relax. I made the right choice. Of course, she couldn't have been waving at me. We barely know each other. We're not friends. I turn up the volume on my phone and walk faster. I just want to go home as quick as possible. However, even with my headphones blaring over my ears, Guy's voice still haunts me. That's right. Pretend that you don't see anyone. Pretend that you don't hear anyone. If you don't talk to them, they'll never hurt you. Well, I know that he's being manipulative and very insulting, but... Oh, my God. I'm pretty sure there are some people out there who are having a ball of a time. I get up unusually late the next morning. Well, morning is probably generous. It's afternoon by the time I put down my phone and roll out of bed. After getting home, I stayed up until 4 a.m. on socials. I didn't even process what I was looking at. I just scrolled. I can hold my newborn kitten in one hand. Famous influencer... Acts like a jerk for the 50th time this week. Modern dating sucks, and we'll all die alone. It was stupid and pointless, but I just wanted to escape. To overload my brain with so much stimulation that I could forget my troubles. I sit up. My head aches. My stomach growls, clawing at my insides. Well, I guess I should eat something. Ooh, what are we having? When I enter the cafeteria, a menagerie of scents assaults my nose. There's the typical array of brunch items, eggs, pancakes, sausages, fruit, and yogurt. There's also a limited selection of normal lunch dishes. I peruse the menu that's posted near the entrance. Usually, I grab something quick and portable that I can take to the park or to my dorm room, like a smoothie or a packaged sandwich, but today, I eye the hot food stations, my mouth watering. I would have to eat at the cafeteria, but... I look around the hall. There aren't too many people here. Just a couple of stragglers. It's late for lunch, so most of the students have already come and gone. 
my grumbling stomach wins out over any reservations I have about eating in public. I really want to eat the... Oh, 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 braised pork goulash, written lentil curry and mushrooms, or macaroni and ch oh, I can't resist a good mac and cheese, but the braised pork goulash, oh, but then again, the curry with mushrooms, mmm, mm, these are all good choices, mac and cheese, please. The student worker dishes out a generous serving of mac and cheese, I take it to a table in the corner. I dig my spoon into the pasta, admiring the white luster of the cheese and the sprinkling of golden bread crumbs on top. The creaminess is heavenly. It only takes me a few minutes to finish half of the dish. It's you! Mind if I sit here? I almost choked on my food. Kali is standing next to me, holding a tray with a grilled cheese sandwich, a container of sweet potato curly fries, and a glass of cola. I raise a hand to cover my coughs and gesture to the seat in front of me. Kale beams and sits down. Didn't think I'd see you here. Did you manage to get any sleep last night? A uh, bit. I'm barely able to get the words out. I'm still frazzled by the sudden intruder at my table. We see what happened because you decided to sit here. Now this guy found you. And you'll have to eat the rest of your lunch trying to have awkward small talk with someone you barely know. The familiar blonde man is sitting next to me, sipping an iced coffee. He glares at Kali. He looks like he wants to strangle the boy. Kali sets his tray down and takes a big bite of his sandwich, melting cheese oozing between his fingers and onto his plate. He chews and swallows before speaking. Also, like, isn't this the same outfit you were wearing yesterday? Did, did, like, did you bother changing out of them or is, is this what you wear all week i was wondering what that smell was man comp sci is so much tougher than i thought it'd be i took it because i thought it would be easier than taking an actual math class but somehow it's even worse he pushes his container of sweet potato fries towards me but i shake my head he takes the fry and chomps it in half <laughs> how's it for you Hard? And that, could you could you speak with your mouth closed? Uh, well, I want to major in it. It's tough. It's not bad. I, I will admit, I actually do find computer science like fascinating. There was a time where I was really into coding. So, I mean, someday I would love to major in it. I actually like it. I'm planning to major in comp sci. Kale nods, taking another bite of his sandwich. I look down. He only just sat down, but the chat is already petering out. I can't keep up a conversation with this guy. I can only hope that he'll eat quickly and leave me alone. Kale puts his grilled cheese down. He wipes his fingers on his napkin before taking out his phone. Hey, do you mind if I add you on try message? None of my friends are taking comp sci, so I don't have anyone to suffer with me. Please? Uh, oh, yeah. Before I can even process what he asks, I'm already fumbling my phone out of my pocket. I nearly drop it. What's your ID? Oh no. My pulse quickens as I open the app that I have never opened before. Gah! On the inside, I'm screaming. It's prompting me to make an account. Guys has finished his coffee. He crosses his legs, turning sideways on a chair to face me with an amused smirk on his face. Oh no. Better not let Kalei see that. He'll find out that you're a hopeless loner. After all, you didn't even bother making an account because you don't have a single friend to add on try message. Oh, screw off, Geist. Sorry, give me a sec. Forgot to update my phone. It's auto-updating now. Oh yeah, no problem. I drop my phone under the table and frantically input my information. It feels like I'm dismantling a bomb. Tick tock, tick tock. I want to strangle the smirking blonde man. I hurriedly change my profile picture to a random picture from my downloads. I got it. Shoot. We add each other on try message. His profile pic is a banana wearing sunglasses and the tag under his name simply says live in life. No way. What? Did I do something wrong? Is my profile weird? Is that detective dog? I look closer at the picture that I chose for my profile pic. Kalei is right. I had inadvertently chosen a fan art of the main character from my 
my favorite movie series, Detective Dog. I can feel my cheeks burning and my heart sinks. Next to me, guys is doubled over, chuckling uncontrollably. Wow, you didn't even make it 10 minutes before showing him what a weirdo you were. An adult that still watches cartoons for children. <laughs> Might as well tell him that you still wet the bed too. Hey, anime is for everyone, okay? And besides, there's some anime out there that, um, that, that are specifically only meant for adults. I'm, what are you on? God damn it, guys. I just thought the art was nice. I don't... <laughs> I love Detective Dog. Oh my god, that face! I can't resist that face! What? What? <laughs> I used to watch that series so much when I was a kid. <sighs> I stopped watching the movies for a while, but I was feeling nostalgic last year and I started to watch them again. They're actually so much better than I remembered. And I noticed so much about them that I didn't appreciate when I was younger. Like how dog's addiction to dog treats is a metaphor for alcoholism. And how the tyranny that the cats have over the city is based on imperialism. What? And when dog stops wearing his collar, he's freeing himself from both his abusive relationship with his wife and the generational trauma that the cats have inflicted on his family. As Kali continues to chatter about the symbolism of the third Detective Dog movie, I'm at a loss for words. I've only met a handful of people who still remember Detective Dog. I can still see the expressions of derision in my mind, poisoning my love for the franchise. I've never met anyone who saw it as anything more than a silly children's car cartoon before. Kali gradually stops talking, it rubs the back of his neck, Apparently realizing how long he has been rambling. Uh, oops. I got a little excited. People don't really remember Detective Dog, you know? Uh, what's your favorite entry in the series? Oh, um... I guess the fifth? Detective Dog versus the Virtual Phantom. I thought the surrealism of the film was so interesting, and for once, it focused less on the mystery and more on Dog's past as part of the police force and the guilt and trauma that he has as a result. It's also the first film that really explores the corruption inherent in the dog society without blaming everything on the cats. Kalei leans forward, sipping at his soda as he nods. I try to restrain myself, but the words tumble out of my mouth before I can catch them. Before long, I'm subjecting Kalei to a 30 minute long spiel about the symbolism of the bananas in the film. Still, he never looks annoyed or disinterested. He listens the entire time, in rapt attention. When I'm done, he brings up his own thoughts, and soon we're engaged in a lively conversation about the use of food metaphors in the series. Before I know it, it's already 3pm. We take our plates to the tray return together, and then we start walking back to the dorms. He lives in the building next to mine. We wave to each other, I take my ID card and swipe into the building. It is only then that I realize that Geist has been standing next to me the entire time. He's eerily quiet, his face as cold as a block of ice. He follows me into my dorm room without saying a word. Even as I start on my classic homework, Geist lingers. He crosses his arms and leans against the back wall, watching me. This is a first for him. When he follows me inside, he usually clings to me and doesn't stop talking until he decides to leave. I open up my textbook. Fine, doesn't matter if he stays, just as long as he's quiet. I spend the afternoon and the early mo evening doing homework. During that time, guys doesn't leave, but I ignore him. My mind is still running with the cheerful memories of my lunch with Calais. When it gets dark, I sneak out to the common room and make myself some pasta. I lie on my bed, my stomach full of cheap carbs. I fish my phone out of my pocket and unlock it. The try message icon catches my attention amidst the mess of apps on my homepage. I click the icon and navigate to Calais. I press on the box to start typing a message. However, when the keyboard pops up, my fingers tremble. The mattress creaks. Guys has left his home against my back wall. He's lying on his side next to me, his head propped up on one hand. He smirks. What are you doing? He just asked for your info to be polite. He 
doesn't actually want to be your friend. He doesn't like you. Why would he? Well, screw you guys. This I'm afternoon, he was just tolerating you. He was being nice, listening to you blabber ad nauseum about things he couldn't care less about. If you text him, he'll just shudder and think, Ah, this person again? So soon. How clingy are they? Save him some headache. Don't text him. My hands freeze up. What if guys this right? What if Clay really was just being nice? If I text him, it'll be a bother. But... Oh, uh, uh, okay, so apparently, okay, apparently, um, there are, there's only one point that matters in this game, which would be Kalei points, and even if you, like, even if you follow, like, through Kalei's route the whole way through, you still have a choice to actually go back into Guy's route at the very end of it. But I do want to show you all the interactions in this game, so I'm just gonna say, don't text Kalei for now. I put my phone down. I shouldn't text him. <laughs> However, a few seconds later, the device buzzes, and messages start to pop up in the chat. Hey, it's me! Well, he's really excited! Man, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think that might be a better idea for me just, like, just, just try and rack up the points and just get to the end of this, Jesus. Kalei! The CS guy? I pondered my reply for a second. Of course, I couldn't forget about you. Besides, it's only been a few hours, lol. I just want to say that I had a lot of fun during lunch. It was super fun talking about Detective Dog. Dog Buds! What? He's too cute! Oh, wait, that's a cat. I chuckle. Yeah, it is. Wolf. Kalei sends a cute sticker of a dog lying on the beach. I respond with a sticker of a dog lying under a blanket, saying that he doesn't want to go to work. We trade stickers like that for a few minutes until our chat log is a veritable dog park. Oh yeah, I was gonna ask. Are you gonna go to tutoring, man? Don't do something that you'll regret. I glare at Geist. I'll be there. Yay! I'll see you there. I drop my phone on the blanket and roll onto my stomach. My heart is racing, but it's not from nervousness for once. I actually feel happy. Excited, even. I'm looking forward to Monday. Kalei and I go to tutoring together on Mondays and Fridays. Afterwards, we usually grab a late night snack. We also text a lot between classes, in the evenings, on the weekends. We chat about a lot of things, though our conversation usually gravitates towards movies. He loves watching about film even more than me. But that's possible. It seems like he has watched every movie produced in the last 30 years. Ranging from rom-coms to biopics to horror. My friendship with Kalei is so easy that it's almost scary. Chatting with him feels like I'm being carried down a gentle river by the movement of the water. It's not difficult or forced, unlike what I'm used to. I think that Kalei... is cute. Kalei is cute. I don't think he would ever be interested in me that way, but... A month after I start going to tutoring with Kalei. I'm sitting at my desk, scrolling away on my laptop. I often spend Saturday evenings browsing random online marketplaces. It's relaxing and it feels like a treasure hunt. I've snagged quite a few vintage DVDs for bargain prices. Right now I'm searching for my white whale. I've invested countless hours searching for this movie, but to no avail. My eyes brighten. I finally find what I've been looking for. Young Detective Dog, the adventure begins. It's not a part of the original Detective Dog timeline. Instead, it was a minor film that was released direct to video, detailing Detective Dog's impoverished origins as a street puppy. It's a valuable piece of the Detective Dog canon, filling the gaps between the prequel series before Detective Dog and the Butler era comics detailing his life as a servant to a noble cat family. Young Detective Dog was outsourced to a smaller animation studio, as a result, it never received that much marketing and only a limited number of prints. It's the only detective dog film that I haven't managed to get my hands on until now. I don't even look at the cost that carefully. I've been searching for this film for months. I'm willing to pay almost any price. As I'm checking out my phone, my... As I'm checking out, my phone buzzes. Hey! So you know how we were talking about the Mad Gun sequel yesterday? 
You want to go see it? I was thinking about going tomorrow. Oh, the new Mad Gun movie. Kalei and I had chatted about it on our way back to the dorm. Admittedly, I wasn't a fan of the Mad Gun franchise, but I had read rave reviews about the new sequel. Couldn't deny that my interest was piqued. I'm about to text OK when a hand drops onto my phone. The pale, tapered fingers rest the device from my grasp. Guy strolls through the other side of the room, waving the phone idly. You'd better not. Why not? I can spend time with whoever I want. Guy comes back and leans against the side of my desk. Texting is easy. You have time to think about what you'll say, and there's no pressure to answer right away. Going to tutoring is fine too. After all, you're mostly working on homework, but going out with him will be different. You'll have to talk to him the entire time. Can you really do that? Well, yeah, I snatched the phone out of Guy's grasp. However, when I open up try message, my palms are sweaty. What if Guy's this right? I tell Curly. God, but I'll I'll have the chance to do that later. Oh God, screw you guys! I'm busy. Sorry, got a lot of homework. I'm just not ready to go tomorrow. I have to learn more about Calais, what he does and doesn't like. I have to practice talking more. I have to come up with topics of conversation. Ah, uh, okay, maybe next time. I bite my lip. Yeah, maybe next time. It'll be ready to go next time. Sunday rolls around, I stay in bed until noon, scrolling aimlessly through a detective dark forum. When I roll out of my mattress, I hobble to the cafeteria to get something to eat. Then I retire back to my dorm to do homework. After I finish my classics and computer science reading, I look at the clock. It's 6 p.m. I groan. Too late to go out or do anything, but too early to go to bed. Might as well watch a movie. I open up my laptop. I spend a few minutes scrolling through a menagerie of cheap horror flakes and holiday-themed rom-coms. Nothing catches my eye, so I settle for one of my usual choices. The movie opens up on a shot of a young girl sitting on a train. The camera slowly zooms out to reveal that the girl is alone, with no guardian in sight. A plain cursive logo appears on screen. My Christmas. This is an old classic from my childhood. I've seen it over ten times already. The girl, Masako, is a child of divorce. She ran away from home to look for her mother. She wants to spend Christmas with her estranged parents. She encounters an old homeless woman, Hana, who agrees to take her to find her mother. I've seen this movie over 10 times already. As I watch the familiar sequences and listen to the dialogue that are memorized by heart, my mind drifts elsewhere. The mad gun showing is long over by now. I wonder if Kali ended up going. Did he find someone else to go with? How was the movie? Was it fun? What if Kalei never invites me to do anything again? I didn't want to go today, but I probably wouldn't want to go tomorrow either. But a small part of me wants to go see a movie with him someday. I hug my pillow tighter. I can already feel the cold fingers of regret creeping into the back of my mind. My mattress creaks. Guys kicks off his Oxford shoes and scoots next to me on the bed, leaning against me. <sighs> I always love this part. It's brilliant. I can't help but tear up every time I see it. God, you've got a heart? On screen, Hana leaves Masako on the streets. As she approaches a well-kept countryside house, Masako's mother opens the door. She's carrying a baby, and a two-year-old clings to her legs. When she sees Hana, she shrinks back, visibly disgusted by Hana's disheveled appearance. I hold my breath as my shoulders tense. No matter how many times I see it, this scene always manages to twist my heart like a wrong rag. Guys reaches over and squeezes my hand. His fingers are cold, but no less reassuring. Hana explains that Masako came to find her mother, but the woman just shakes her head. I'm not that girl's mother anymore, she says, and she shuts the door. My heart! My mind drifts to Kalei again. What if he doesn't want to be friends anymore? What if he never texts me again? Maybe he'll assume that I don't like him because I rejected his invite. On screen, Hana turns around to see Masako's forlorn face. What's that mama? The girl asks, her eyes wide. 
My eyes sting. I'm not sure if it's because of the movie or the agitated thoughts running around in my head. Masako's expression here is simply heartbreaking. Such a good performance from a child actress. Hana kneels down and hugs Masako. It's a touching scene. The emotional climax of the film. Masako finds her mother, even if she isn't related by blood, and Hana embraces the daughter she never knew she wanted. Kalei probably hates me now. I'm sure that he's tired of my existence. I already erased me from try message. Hana and Masako return to Masako's father, who is distraught with worry. There is a time skip to spring. The screen pans over several beautiful shots of cherry blossoms. Hana is clean, wearing new clothes. She holds Masako's hand as the pair walks to the girls' school. The perfect happy ending. Mother and child walking side by side to a new future. The room instantly darkens as the credits scroll over a black background. Small children's doodles dance along the sides of the screen. I squeeze my eyes shut. I've ruined everything. Why do I always ruin everything? Every single friendship I touch crumbles to dust. Guys traces circles around my knuckles. Each slow movement erases some of the disquiet from my mind. I unconsciously lean against the blonde man. For some reason, I'm exhausted. I just want to stop thinking, to stop worrying. Guys welcomes the contact, nuzzling against me. He whispers into my ear. I can tell that he's smiling. He delights in my vulnerability. See? <laughs> that was fun, wasn't it? You didn't even want to see that movie with Kalei anyway. Your weekends are precious. This way you got to spend it watching a movie you love. With me. Yeah. I guess. I'm too tired to offer a rebuttal. I curl up on the mattress. Guy shuts the laptop. He leans down and presses a kiss against the back of my hand, his lips ghosting over my clenched fingers. It was fun. I'll see you again. Huh. Despite my worries, Kalei meets me the following Monday with, a, with the same smile that he always wears. I don't think that his smile is fake. I can only hope that it isn't fake. And there. I admire the concluding paragraph to my classics paper. It came out rather well, if I do say so myself. I'm spending another Saturday evening at the library, as I often do. It's become a couple it's been a couple of weeks since Kalei invited me to go to the movies. It's already ten? I groan. Hope hopefully I have something in my dorm to eat for dinner. I pack up the laptop, books, and paper scattered over the desk and head to the library exit. As soon as I open the library door, I freeze. There are hundreds of people outside. The plaza is filled with blaring music. It's a boisterous rock song with dramatic crescendos. The theme song from a recent Halloween-themed blockbuster. It's Halloween. They must be having a party. Guy is standing next to me. He strides in front. When he's standing at the end of one, the, when he's standing at the end of the steps, he turns back towards me and bows. Gesturing towards the crowd with one arm, he acts like he's ushering in my arrival to a royal ball. Shall we go? I take a step down. My legs are shaking. Wait, 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 what, what, wait. Is it, doesn't guys usually, like, encourage me to just, like, you know, just, like, chill back and be a bit more introverted? Like, what in the world, guys? There are so many people. They swarm around me, pressing against my body. The smell of smoke is sickeningly sweet, wrapping around me like a vice. A tall student rams into my shoulder, spilling a few drops of beer on my hoodie. I try to breathe, but no matter how deeply I inhale, it feels like my lungs are being filled with sand. I take a step. It's like I'm wading through mud. The music is so loud, I can't even hear myself think. There are flashing lights everywhere. The students are wearing glow sticks around their necks and wrists. They look like fireflies. Swaying in the dark. Where's Geis? For once, I look around for him, aching to see a blonde head, a familiar beacon in a sea of shadows, but he's nowhere to be found. My vision is getting blurry. The shadows of the students all around me blend together, pressing against me, squeezing the breath from my lungs. My legs buckle, and soon I'm kneeling on the pavement. I try to stand back up, but I'm shaking too much. If I move, I'll topple over. My heart is pounding. Beating like a war drum. I feel like I'm going to be sick. 
I look up. Everyone is staring. They look down at me, their eyes driving into me like knives. Some of them turn to talk to each other, talking, gossiping about me. Here you are, the center of attention, the star. Go on, put on a show. Show them what a mess you are. Oh, screw off, guys. Like, right now, like, I... Like, right now, this is coming up less as hot and, like, more infuriating. God damn, guys. I can't see him. I know that Geist is behind me. It's getting hard to hear. It's getting hard to see, too. It feels like I'm drowning in the depths of the ocean. The only thing I can hear clearly is Guy's sardonic voice whispering in my ear. The only thing I can feel clearly is his breath against my neck. I'm gasping for breath. I'm suffocating. I'm hey, are you okay? A fuzzy figure is kneeling in front of me. I can't see who it is. My vision is too blurry. When I don't reply, he puts a reassuring hand on my shoulders, urging me to stand. Come on, let's sit down somewhere. He tugs on my sleeve, leading me through the people surrounding us. As we walk, the crowd thins, the music quiets, and the smell of smoke weakens. He opens a door and guides me inside. I look around. My mind is still fuzzy, but I can tell that we're back in the library, foyer. The boy sits me down on one of the couches. It's hard to focus. I try to concentrate on his feet. I can only think about one thing. Why is this guy wearing socks with sandals? It's quiet now. So quiet that I can hear how fast my heart is beating. It's still racing, thrumming in my ears like a hummingbird's wings. My skin feels cold and clammy. Do you mind if I sit with you? Uh, I don't mind. I want to be alone. I want to be alone. Sorry. Um, okay. Text me if you need anything. I'll be around. Shoots. I squeeze my eyes shut and try to breathe slowly, but I can't stop shaking. The air scrapes into my lungs like sandpaper, grating against my trachea. When I look up again, Kalei is gone. I lean my elbows to my knees and bury my head in my hands. My heart won't stop pounding, threatening to burst out of my chest. Cold fingertips trace along my chin, tipping my face until I'm gazing into a pair of emerald eyes. Guy surprises me, his gaze flicking over my wrinkled sweatshirt and my teary eyes. I'm biting my bottom lip in an attempt to stop it from trembling. The blonde man's emotions are inscrutable. Is he angry? Worried? I can't tell. His face is blank. It's as if he's still deciding what expression to wear, like he's picking a jacket from his wardrobe. His visage twists into a look of pity. He looks at me as if I'm an injured puppy lying in the rain. He sighs. I knew that this would happen. Then why did you put me through this? So fragile. You're like fine china. You're not fit to be paraded around in front of the masses. You'll chip and crack like you are right now. And yet you push me in such an uncomfortable situation, Geist? Geist wraps his arms around me, burying my face in the crook of his neck. You're okay. I'm here for you. I'm not going anywhere. Man! Man, the stench of manipulation is real strong today. Look at how helpless you are. Just like a little lamb. You need me. Don't worry. I'll protect you from everyone. No one will touch you while I'm here. I squeeze my eyes shut. Geist is holding me tightly. So tightly that I feel as if my ribs are going to break. But his touch isn't comforting. Instead, it feels cold, like I'm being suffocated in a blanket of ice. My heart isn't slowing. It's shaking in my chest, like an animal trying to escape its cage. No matter how deeply I breathe, it still feels like I'm drowning. I don't know how long it takes for me to recover. Locked in Geist embrace, by the time that I recover enough to stand up, most of the partygoers have gone back inside. 
I make my way back on shaky legs, holding onto Guy's hand for dear life. He walks slowly, keeping my pace. When we reach my dorm building, he pulls me into one last hug before waving goodbye. I shiver and go inside, slamming the door behind me. I groan into my pillow. I can't believe what I did last night, in front of Carly of all people. I bet he's gossiping to all of his friends right now. The weirdest thing happened to me last night. A freak had a complete breakdown in the middle of the main plaza. Crazy, right? Guys, you're the only person who thinks that way. The blonde man dangles the phone in front of my face. He texted you. Shouldn't you hurry and see what it's about? I bat the phone away and turn around. I want to stop time. I want to curl up in a corner and hide forever so that I never have to see Kalei again. The phone buzzes once more. But real life doesn't have a remote. I can't hit pause on it because I'm feeling overwhelmed. I roll back over and reluctantly accept the phone from Geist. Hey, how are you feeling? Okay? I was kind of worried. Just want to check how you're doing. Do you need anything? I squeeze my eyes shut, composing myself before I reply. I'm okay. I don't know what happened last night. The sort of thing doesn't usually happen to me. Sorry for bothering you. Ah, don't worry. Just glad to see you're good. I was wondering, are you busy? Tonight? Me and some friends are getting together to watch a movie. It's called a social experiment. Wanna come? We'll probably talk story after. There's gonna be pizza. And fun. My lips curl to a smile. After our first text exchange, the, um, the cat face has become something of an inside joke. Yes. Yes, go on. Except... Now you can put on an encore performance. You can curl up on the floor in front of Calais and all of his friends and have a complete mental breakdown. Again. This is starting to come off as funny. I don't know why. <laughs> that won't happen. Last night was different. That never happens to me. There were just too many people. This is small and private. If anything happens, I could just say I need to go to the bathroom or something. Guys places a finger under my chin. Tipping my face up so that I have to look at him. Do you really believe that? Sure, you're going to go out with a bunch of strangers and have a fantastic time. By the end of it all, you'll be best friends for life. What kind of fantasy land are you living in? Has that ever happened to you? Even once? Guy's words radiate cold. They send chills running through my limbs making the hair on my arms stand on end. If you say yes, it can only go poorly. You'll embarrass yourself. You won't even get along with his friends. What if they start mocking you because of how socially inept you are? Say no. I am going to decline the invite. I've already got plans. Sorry. When I send the message, I shut the app and close my eyes shut. It only takes a few seconds for the phone to ding with the familiar notification. Aw, next time then. Don't worry, it's my fault. Asking you all of a sudden. Hope whatever you got going on is awesome. See you Monday. I toss my phone onto the bedspread next to me. Guy smiles smugly. I spent a couple of hours scrolling on my phone, watching silly videos online. Eventually, my stomach growls, telling me to go to the cafeteria. I sneak into the dining hall, peering in and sweeping my eyes all around for signs of the familiar sky blue baseball cap. Kalei is nowhere to be seen. Not that I expected to see him here, but it doesn't hurt to be careful. I pull the hood over my head a little tighter before sneaking past the cashier to the display cooler on the other side of the cafeteria. I peruse the selection of sandwiches wrapped in shiny plastic. I choose a, woo spicy chicken salad sandwich, mozzarella sandwich with sun-dried, oh, that sounds so good, roasted vegetable sandwich, ooh, 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 get me the mozza sandwich. I picked a mozzarella sandwich with sun-dried tomatoes out of the cooler. I take my prize to the cashier and hand her my ID. After the purchase is complete, I go out the door, shivering as the icy air penetrates my lungs. It's not freezing, but it's still cold enough that I can see faint white puffs as I inhale. Oh, exhale. I wander to a secluded corner of the campus, nearing the Performing Arts Building. I sit on a nearby bench, the cold wood stinging my skin. I bite into my sandwich, 
The bread is cold. The creamy pesto-smeared mozzarella and tangy tomatoes slide down my throat. I choke down half of the sandwich, barely tasting my meal. I should have brought a drink too. Guilt bubbles up in my stomach. Kale had gone through the trouble of inviting me to meet his friends. He had gone out of his way to be nice to me, and I threw his kindness back to his face. He reached out to me, and I lied to him. For what? Because I was uncomfortable? Afraid? Of what? Talking to a few strangers? What kind of adult is afraid of talking to strangers? A miserable excuse of a human being can muster up the willpower to exchange a few nice to meet you with some new people. I'm pathetic. I'm so pathetic. What is Kale? Why is Kale trying to be friends with someone like me? I squeeze my hands around the sandwich. It feels icy in my fingers. <sighs> Come now. Don't cry. He's here again. He sits next to me on the bench. He wipes away the tears, sprouting from the corners of my eyes before sliding his hand onto my shoulders. Guys rubs the small on my back, easing away the tension. He's unexpectedly quiet, but he appears. He doesn't... He usually doesn't stop talking, but this time he sits, waiting for my sniffles to subside. His voice is soft and soothing, like a warm blanket tinged with the scent of lavender. Look up at the sky. I hesitate before looking up. The sky is hazy from light pollution, but up above, I can see stars twinkling in the distance, far above the city lights. I breathe deeply, in and out. The cold night air courses through my lungs, refreshing me from the inside out. It's beautiful, right? I nod. See, this isn't so bad, is it? You like being by yourself. With me, it's the only time that you can be comfortable. If you had accepted Calais' invitation, you'd be stuck for hours in some small room with strangers. It would have been nothing but an awkward experience for everyone. Who knows when you would have been able to leave. Now you can spend your Friday night relaxing under the stars. After you eat, you can go back home and watch that show that you've been meaning to catch up on. Maybe you can go to the library and get a head start on your homework. You didn't refuse Kale's invite because you were afraid. You did it because you know what you like and you wanted to spend this time alone. You lied to him to spare his feelings. That's not a crime. Other people want to go and party, but you're not like that. You like the solitude, the quiet. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just the way you are. I don't know if Geist is lying, but I want to believe him. His words are fine liquor, intoxicating me and numbing my pain. My worries settle, buried underneath a thick layer of Geist's placation. Are you feeling all right now? I instinctively lean against Geist, who puts an arm around my shoulder. He's not warm, but his presence is a comfort nonetheless. I'm not sure if I'm feeling alright, but it doesn't hurt as much. My raw self-hatred has dulled to a vague ache. It returns to a corner of my brain to sleep, until it finds an opportunity to rear its ugly head again. Yeah. I finish the rest of my sandwich, which is even colder than before. After that, I relax into Geist's hold. Gazing up at the sky. That's right. This is fun. I like admiring the stars. Alone with Geist. I made the right choice. Around a month has passed since Kalei invited me to meet his friends. I lounge on my bed, scrolling through my feed. <sighs> is it Kalei? I scan my notifications. It's not. Instead, I got an email. I run down to the mail room. When I talk to the student that's manning the desk, my excitement is so high that I can get the words out without stumbling over them. Minutes later, I'm clutching the package to my chest like it's my most precious treasure. In my room, I carefully open the box. A DVD case covered in slightly worn plastic is lying amidst the crumpled up newspaper. Young Detective Dog, The Adventure Begins. I can't suppress the grin spreading on my face. I've been waiting to see this film for so long. I open up my desk to search for my DVD player, but then I pause. I wonder if Kalei would want to watch this. When we were talking about the franchise before, he mentioned that he hasn't watched this one. I'm not surprised. It's not available online and physical copies are hard to come by. Should I? 
Invite him over. I've never invited anyone over. In fact, I've never invited anyone to hang out. Period. When I did invite... When I did spend time with friends, they were always the ones to reach out. Some small, deep part of my heart always believed that if I asked someone out, they would feel burdened. That spending time with me was a chore. That they had much better things to do than be with me. But this is different, right? Clay would want to watch this movie too. And maybe... Just maybe... He would have fun with me. I take up my phone, my finger hovering over the try message icon. Stop. Guy is sitting on the bed, leaning over me. He reaches over and tries to take the phone out of my grasp. But this time, I don't let go. I wrest my hands from his grip. What do you think is happening with that guy? What? Is he your bestie? Your dear friend? Maybe he even <laughs> likes you. I don't want to listen to this. I push Geist off of me. I get up and grab my head, my headphones from my desk. But his voice slips past the headphones, snaking into my eardrums. What? Get your head out of the clouds. He tolerates you because he wants someone to go to tutoring with. If he had anyone else, he wouldn't even look at you. God, you're a real piece of work, Geist. I turn away and crouch down, pressing the headphones so hard over my ears that it feels like I'm crushing my skull. He doesn't like you. He never liked you. No one likes you. Geist embraces me from behind, squeezing me tightly. He rests his chin on my shoulder. I love you. I only have your best interests at heart. Uh, did you have my best interest at heart when you shot me in the middle of a crowd? The world is dangerous. I'm trying to protect you. He says as he pushes me into another crowd? You can't trust anyone. They all hate you. They all wish that you would just disappear from the face of the earth. Man, you really suck, Geist. His voice is scalding and freezing at the same time. Honey that drips into my ears, burning my eardrums like acid. If you trust them, if you let them in, they'll all hurt you eventually. He takes the phone out of my grasp. My grip is too limp to hang on any longer. But that's okay. I'm here for you. You only need me. I accept, guys. Guy's touch is chilly, but it's comforting at the same time. It feels like I'm lying in a blizzard, watching as the snow pow on top of me until it entombs me in a blanket of ice. I turn around and bury my head in Guy's chest. He stiffens as if he didn't expect the affection, but he accepts me. He strokes my back, resting his chin on my head. Is it okay that I'm a mess? Of course it's okay. I'll love you no matter how messed up you are. Is it okay that I ruin everything? That I make everyone unhappy? That everyone will hate me eventually? It doesn't matter if you ruin everything. I'll be there to dry your tears and pick up the pieces. It doesn't matter if everyone hates you. I'm here. I'll always be here. His voice is soft and gentle, softer and gentler than I had ever heard. You're perfect the way you are. You don't need to be someone that you're not. You're not a social butterfly or a party animal. You like being alone, and that's okay. I wouldn't want you to change for anyone. You're happy right now, right? Just as you are with me. He strokes my head. I breathe slowly, my lashes fluttering against Guy's Kashmir turtleneck. I don't know if I feel happy exactly. I don't feel any pangs of dopamine coursing through my brain. No sparks of excitement. No soothing serotonin. I just feel a little dull, like everything is far away, and I'm only attached to my body by a thread. It feels as if Guy's embrace has protected me from everything, including my own raw thoughts and feelings. At least it doesn't hurt. I guess that I feel... calm? Is... 
this what being calm feels like? I don't know. I don't know anymore. I just nod. When guys feels me move against his chest, he leans down and presses his lips against my head. That's right. You're happy. You're just accepting yourself, and that's okay. You're perfect. I love you the way you are. I ended up offering to lend Calais the DVD. He accepted it happily, and after he watched it, we had a lively discussion about Young Detective Dog. After our introductory computer science class ended, and the new semester started, my text of Calais slowed down to a trickle. We didn't have any reason to keep chatting, so we just text each other every once in a while. We don't share any classes either, so we stopped meeting entirely. I still see him around campus sometimes, but I never say hi. And so, whatever relationship we had mostly withered away. Human relationships are so fragile like that. If you stop watering them, they waste away in an instant. Kalei wasn't any different. He was the same as anyone else. But Geist is different. He never leaves me. Even if I don't see him, I know that he's there. I lie in bed, my head resting on Geist's lap. It's a sunny spring Saturday, but... I feel oddly tired, so decided not to go out today. On my laptop, Dog runs from the police, taking refuge in the shadows of a bridge overlooking a canal. This is the seventh time I've watched Young Detective Dog. The adventure begins. Although it was exciting to watch the first time, now it's more of a habit. I can remember each line of dialogue, each twist and turn in the story. Somehow I can't bring myself to watch new things nowadays. It's emotionally exhausting, getting invested in new characters and not knowing how things will turn out. So I bask in the comforting familiarity of old movies and shows. My phone buzzes. I check the screen. A text from Clay. I consider answering, but I put the device down without reading the notification. I'm too tired to respond right now. I'll answer later. Guy smiles and takes the phone. He leans over and places it on my desk, out of reach. He places his hand on my shoulder. His presence a soothing weight. The movie passes by in a blur, but by the time I know it, we're already at the last scene. He have to successfully take it down the real culprit. Doug is approached by the wealthy cat lady, who will become his master. He puts on his hat and looks into the distance. I don't know what'll happen to me from now on, but I know one thing. I'm not just a poor orphan dog. He gets into the cat's car, and the screen fades to black. The credits start to roll. I shut my laptop, not bothering to pause the video player or put the DVD away. I get up and start rearranging my blanket. Are you sleepy? Thinking of taking a nap? Yeah. I get under my blanket. I hadn't bothered changing on my pajamas today, so I don't need a change of clothes. Oh. Hi there. Guys lies down next to me, pressing a kiss to my temple. Good night. I'll be here when you wake up. It's okay. This is just the way I am. This is me. I like being alone. Along with Geist. Geist wraps his arms around me and sighs, his breath tickling the back of my neck. It's okay. Even if no one else likes you. Even if they tolerate your presence. <laughs> I love you. I'll never leave you. As I lie under my blanket, wrapped in that man's embrace, a heavy fatigue drapes over me. Somehow, nothing seems to matter anymore. And that's alright. Oh, that's the end of that route. Alright, this time we're gonna go down Calais route, so um, the first choice I'm gonna offer to help. Um, The boy looks up, eyes brightening in interest. I edge closer. He scoots over to make room for me. There. You didn't increment your counter variable, so the loop never stops running. Ah, uh, so that's what it was. <laughs> he types the correction and runs the program. It runs without freezing, even though it doesn't output the correct answer. You saved me. Whew, thank you. Uh, what's your name? I'm Clay. I'm Lion. Nice to meet you. We're in the same lecture, right? I'm pretty sure I've seen you around. I nod my head. My eyes inadvertently skirt around his face, avoiding direct contact. We return to our respective problem sets. Once or twice, he reaches out to me for a question or asks me what problems I'm working on. 
Every time he opens his mouth, my stomach does a backflip. Slowly, the other students fall out of the room. Soon, Kalei and I are the only ones left. The door opens. A female student hovers in the doorway. And I'm pretty sure all this is the same, so we're gonna skip ahead. Okay, so someone has approached us in an alley. As much as my instincts are telling me, like, to just ignore it, I'm gonna wave. <laughs> I tentatively raise my hand, keeping it close to my body. Her eyes flash over me for a second, before she looks past me, waving more enthusiastically. I look over my shoulder. Another girl is jogging out of the library. It feels like someone dumped my heart into ice water. I hurriedly retract my hand, pretending that I'm adjusting the straps on my backpack. I know it's already too late. Guy's voice is piercing, effortlessly penetrating the headphones that are shielding my ears. How humiliating. How could you have ever thought she was waving at you? <laughs> you barely know her. You've talked to her a couple of times. That doesn't mean you're friends. Ah, shut up, Geist. My mouth tightens, and my eyes burn. He's right. Of course she... Couldn't have been waving at me. We barely know each other. We're not friends. I turn up the volume on my phone and walk faster. I just want to get home as quick as possible. However, even with my headphones blaring over my ears, Guy's voice still haunts me. That's right. Pretend that you don't see anyone. Pretend that you don't hear anyone. If you don't talk to them, they'll never hurt you. Okay, okay, we heard all this before. We'll see you later, guys, and we'll skip ahead. Right, and over here, I'm gonna go ahead and text Kalei, because why not? I mean, he is such a- he is such a ball of sunshine, and I love him. I flop onto my side, facing away from Geist. He snorts. What do I say? I can't sound too casual. We're not that friendly, but I shouldn't sound too formal, either. Should I add emojis? How many? Should I say hi, or hello, or hey? Will thanks or thank you be better? Should I apologize for talking too much or should I thank him for listening? After typing and retyping the message several times, I eventually came up with something that I'm happy with. Hey, sorry to bother you. Just wanted to say it was really fun talking to you today. Thanks. As soon as I hit the send button, I smash my head into the pillow. Guy sighs. Oh, could you be any more awkward? What is this? A thank you email after a job interview? The social ineptitude is dripping off your text. Oh my god, shut up, guys. I groan. I wish there was an unsend button. <laughs> my phone buzzes. I squeeze my eyes shut, smothering my pace with the pillows as I get ready to look at the screen. Hey, you texted me. Yeah. So, oh, I should thank you. It was super fun to talk about Detective Dog. Dog buds. Woof. Oh wait, that's a cat. I chuckle. Yeah, it is. Woof. And we've already seen all this, so we're just gonna skip ahead. Alright, so Kalei is inviting us over for a movie. I'm just gonna say okay. I grit my teeth. Making conversation is no big deal. I can do it. Talking of Kalei is easy anyway. I'd love to go. Great. I'll come pick you up at 11. I respond with a thumbs up. Guys leans over me. His displeasure slathered over his face. He smells like mint. Sharp and cold. I warned you. Just wait. You'll see what happens. Oh, what? You're gonna push me into another crowd? Well, we, we haven't got to that point yet. I know you're gonna do it, guys. You piece of poo. I pick up my pillow and throw it at him, but he's already gone. I sit on my bed, breathing hard. The blonde man is gone, but the butterflies in my stomach aren't going away. Instead, they're just flapping their wings more and more violently, turning my guts into soup. I hope that guy's this wrong. Man, that was awesome. I was wondering if it was going to be some cheap cash grab, considering it's been 20 years since the last installment. But it was really interesting. I liked how the original protagonist became the mentor to the next generation. Oh, it's one of these. Damn. As we exited the cinema complex, Kalei's eyes lit up. He pointed to the food court, the bright signage beckoning us inside. Oh, I'm starving. Wanna grab some grinds? I am hungry. I feel like eating a, uh, vegan banh mi, ramen, loco moco. What's a loco moco? Wait, wait, wait what, what's a loco moco? Apparently this is a loco moco. It's a Hawaiian dish and it looks absolutely delicious. It seems a lot like comfort food, so hell yeah to loco moco. I go to the Hawaiian plate lunch shop and order a loco moco. Minutes later, I carry my tray back to the table. Kalei is already sitting down. The glistening bowl of rice, 
topped with spicy mayo slattered tuna, is sitting in front of him. He splits his chopsticks. That looks pretty action. I take a bite of the loco moco. Make sure to get a big spoonful of rice, gravy topped hamburger, and creamy egg yolk. Anyway, that was so good, right? I especially like the scene where the sergeant finally puts down his uniform. I nod, chewing my food as I listen to him. Kalei talks for several minutes, rambling about his favorite scenes and the acting performances of the leads. When his steam is all used up, he scratches the back of his head and returns his attention to his poke bowl. Sorry, I did it again. I talk so much. My friends usually have to tell me to shut up. <laughs> it's okay. I like listening to you. Really? He looks embarrassed. Oh, thanks. That's nice of you. No one has ever said that to me before. What do you think of the movie? I like the, uh... Ooh. Oh, okay. Action sequences, characters, themes. I'm usually one to talk about the themes, um... And oftentimes, like, the setting of a movie. So, let's go with themes. I really like the themes. Considering that the sergeant's entire goal is the, uh, in the original series of the film was to prove himself to his father... I thought it was fitting that in this film, he finally found peace with himself and his accomplishments, despite never receiving his father's approval. Kalei nods, listening intently as he chewed on a slice of pickled radish. We talk about the movie for several minutes, but the conversation quickly uh, slows down. To be honest, I'm not all that familiar with the Mad Gun series. I watched the original film years ago, and I just read the synopsis as a refresher. This movie was excellent, but... It was just a very solid, entertaining action film overall. I can't think of much to talk about. But yeah, it was really good. I'm glad that we came to see it. My voice trails off. Hmm. Kalei grins sheepishly and takes a bite off his Poke Bowl before washing it down with a sip of Coke. Oh no. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. Uh-oh. The conversation stopped. What will you do now? Ah, screw up, Geist! He's standing behind me. He slides his hand over my shoulders, tracing my clavicle. Feels like he's about to grab my throat and strangle me. See? I told you that this would happen. Hey, like, sometimes a conversation dies down and that's completely fine. Sometimes you just... Sometimes you can just chill around with friends and not do anything. That's completely fine. He's getting bored. He's realizing that you're not the interesting person that he thought you were. Soon he'll regret ever inviting you to hang out with him. My skin feels cold. I look at Kalei. He's looking at a nearby shop selling rice balls. He's probably thinking about how boring this conversation is. How much he regrets inviting me out. How much he regrets being my friend. I take another bite, but it's hard to swallow. The food feels like glue in my throat. I want to vomit. Why don't you excuse yourself to the bathroom? Stay in there a while. And when you come out, you can pretend that you got food poisoning. At least that way, you'll think that you're miserable company because you're ill. And not because you're just a miserable person. I managed to choke down the bite of my food. Guys is right. It wouldn't even be a lie. My food is settling uneasily in my stomach. I place my hands on the other side of my seat, getting ready to scoot back from the table. Do you ever wonder what life would be like if you were the last person alive? Oh. Wait, what? 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 My retreat is interrupted by Clay's sudden interjection. No, like, seriously. Post-apocalyptic movies always focus on the survival aspect. But what if that's not the problem? Assume you've got a shelter and all the food, water, and electricity you want. But you're completely alone. You've got all this time on your hands. What would you do with it? Is this what he's talk thinking about? The hypothetical apocalypse? What made you think about that all of a sudden? That's random. Well, I don't know. Sometimes these thoughts pop up in your head, you know? And they just keep scratching at the inside of your skull until you let them out. He takes his hat up and ruffles his hair. Look a little embarrassed. He puts the hat back on. I guess I would, uh, travel, watch all the movies I can before I die, stay alive. I mean, I'm gonna be bored as hell. <laughs> I'm gonna be bored as hell during the apocalypse. God. Oh, I mean, watching all the movies I can, it's fun. Traveling? I mean, it, like, in a world that's that desolate? I mean, yeah, it's an idea. Um, gotta make sure that I've got enough supplies, though. 
Oh, ooh, I can even get more supplies. I actually, like, traveling is not a bad idea. Staying alive, though? Mm, that's a boring answer. Uh, travel or watch all the movies? Not uh, travel. I travel the world, see all the sites, visit every country that I can, have grand adventures, steal as many supplies as I can. What about you? What would you do if everyone disappeared on you? Hmm, I guess I would travel around and look for people. I thought that you said you were the last person alive. You already know that there aren't any other people, right? Well, I think if I actually believed that, I wouldn't be able to handle it, knowing that I'm all alone in this huge world. God, I am loving Kalei, actually. If I keep searching, then I can hope that I'll find someone someday. Even if it doesn't happen, the thought would keep me alive. You know? I understand Kalei's feelings, but I can't relate. I've thought more than once that if I was all alone in the world, then it wouldn't be too bad. I wouldn't have to worry about dealing with anyone. My mind could finally stop screaming at me. I could finally be at peace, and maybe guys would leave me alone. Sorry for killing the mood with that weird question. I shake my head. Nah, well, it was kind of weird, but I get it. Sometimes you can't control your thoughts, and it was an interesting question. I just needed some time to think about it. Kalei chuckles awkwardly and leans forward. How's your food? Ooh, looks cherry. Oh, uh, it's good. You want a bite? Somehow I feel a little more relaxed. Kalei's bizarre question had knocked me out of my maelstrom of my thoughts. Hmm. He hadn't been obsessing about me or my shortcomings. He had just been in his own head, wondering about something that had nothing to do with me. I almost laugh. Of course Kalei wasn't focused on me the entire time. I'm not the sun. He doesn't revolve around me. He has his own random fleeting thoughts. After we finish lunch, we drop by a charity store and browse through their used DVDs. We don't talk the entire time, but at the very least, I don't feel tempted to run to the bathroom when the conversation slows down. When I flop onto my bed later that evening, exhaustion envelops my body, but it's a different kind of exhaustion than normal. A good kind of exhaustion. And there. I admire the concluding paragraph to my classics paper. It came out rather well, if I do say so myself. I'm spending another Saturday evening at the library, as I often do. It's been a couple of weeks since Kalei invited me to go to the movies. We've already seen all this, so let's just skip ahead. Alright, Kalei is trying to calm us down, so I'm just gonna say I don't mind if he chills with us. Uh, I don't mind. Okay, wait here. I'll be right back. He returns a few minutes later. Setting a cold bottle of water against my shin. The chilly sensation um, tingles against my skin, grounding me. I look up. Kalei's brow is furrowed with worry. It doesn't suit his face, normally so sunny and cheerful. Guilt gnaws in my chest. Hi. Are you sick? Did you drink too much? Or are you having a panic attack? A panic attack. I had never considered that before. I had similar episodes in the past, but I just told myself that everyone feels nervous sometimes. My episodes were normal. I... I was normal. Now he knows that you're a freak. Someone who can't even handle normal life. A person who's constantly on the verge of a complete mental breakdown. Yeah, screw off, Geist. Geist is sitting next to me on the couch. My arm draped around... Oh, his arm draped around my shoulders. His cold fingertips are tickling my earlobe. It feels like I'm being buried alive. I'm having a panic attack. I think I'm having a panic attack. I say it quietly, the words stumbling over my tongue. I almost don't want Kalei to hear. It's strange, labeling what is happening to me like this. Part of me is glad to give it a name. To put a face to this monster that has tormented me for so many years. Part of me is terrified of this label, this brand singing my skin, marking me as someone irreparably broken. Got it. Okay, 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 okay. Breathe with me, okay? In. Ooh, out. In. Out. Good job, good job. Can I hold your hand? Yeah. I nod. He grasps my hand and squeezes it. His hand is warm and reassuring as he leads me through some deep breaths. You're okay. Everything is going to be okay. Ooh, I'm here for you. 
I'm not going anywhere. He repeats this over and over as he continues to help me breathe. With each reassurance, it feels like a rock is lifted off of my chest. Once I've calmed down, Kalei gives my hand one final squeeze before letting go. How are you feeling? All right. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Do you want to go home? Are you going to be okay walking through the crowd? I nod again. Clay helps me to my feet. I follow closely behind him as he leads me back out into the masses of people. It's still suffocating, but it's different this time. Clay walks in front of me, parting the crowd like the Red Sea. Meanwhile, I focus on the plumerias on Clay's back, counting each flower petal. By the time that I'm finished, we're out of the heart of the gathering. There are only a few stragglers surrounding us now. I let out the breath that I didn't know that I was holding. I jog up to Kalei's side. I'm sorry for bothering you. My cheeks are burning. I want to disappear, to crawl into some hole that leads straight to the center of the earth and never come back out. It's no problem at all. I wanted to get some air anyway. Big parties like this aren't usually my thing. Guy sidles up next to me, his hands in his pockets. Look at you. You've completely ruined his night. He could have had fun with everyone else, but he had to babysit you. Ah, screw off, guys. You're the reason why we're in this situation in the first place. My hands hover around the headphones slung around my neck. I want to put them on, but it would be too rude with Kalei here. I'm not usually like this. I'm a little embarrassed that I... I said like this in front of you. Clay doesn't look surprised. Instead, he dons a strange expression of grim understanding. It happens to a lot of people. It's nothing to be ashamed of. What a liar. It happens to a lot of people. Who, exactly? Has he ever even met anyone as freakish as you? I'm your friend. I'm here to support you. Always. Oh, how generous. He's offering to be your crutch because of how fragile you are. Galay kicks a stone lying in the path. It skips down the cement, landing in a nearby patch of flowers. One of my relatives has a panic attack sometimes. She's brilliant. One of the smartest and kindest people I know. But she feels things a lot, you know? And it can be overwhelming. So sometimes she just ah, needs a few minutes to process her emotions and... I hold her hand and talk her through it. It's no big deal at all. No big deal? Collapsing in the middle of a crowd and troubling everyone was no big deal? I don't know what to think of that. Part of me is annoyed by Kalei's flippancy, the way he dismisses my suffering with a few easy words, and yet, part of me is also strangely reassured by his nonchalance. As I'm mulling over the statement, we reach the building. I fumble my ID card out of my pocket and swipe it through the reader. Thank you. I wave to Kalei and shut the door, his words ringing in my ears. I groan into my pillow. Can't believe what I did last night. In front of Kalei, of all people. I bet he's gossiping to all of his friends right now. The weirdest thing happened to me last night. A freak had a complete breakdown in the middle of the main plaza. Crazy, right? Ah, <laughs> shut up, guys. And I'm pretty sure guys are supposed to be a manifestation of our inner thoughts, but... Well, we can talk about that later. For now, let's just skip ahead. All right, Kalei has invited us over for another movie and pizza, so I'm going to accept the invitation. Okay. It only takes a few seconds for the phone to ding with the familiar notification. Really? Yay. I'll come get you right now. Sec. When I exit the building, Kalei is already there. His cheeks and ears tinged pink from the cold. He waves excitedly to me with both hands. He leads me through the darkened campus, along the lamplit paths, until we reach the student union. When he opens the door, I'm greeted by a trio of new faces. One girl and one guy are lounging on the couch in front of the TV. Another girl is unrolling paper towels and stacking them next to a couple of pizza boxes. This is Mari, Naya, and Asher. Everyone, this is Lion. Nice to meet you. I and Asher wave in acknowledgement. Mari hands me a plate and a paper towel. Help yourself. This one's vegan. She opens the oily cardboard boxes, revealing two pizzas. 
One is covered in tomato sauce, vegan mozzarella, and basil. The other has basil, pasto, sausage, roasted peppers, and goat cheese. Oh, wait, I oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. Oh, they're both good. I would have both. Why can't I have both? Pizza is pizza. I would take both. Um, basil pesto first. I grab a size of the basil pesto. The herbaceous scent makes my mouth water. What drink you like? Beer or soda? Or just water? Uh, beer, please. I'm here to enjoy myself. I accept a can of beer. It's ice cold. I wipe some of the condensation out before cracking it open. Kalei takes a slice of the pesto pizza and I sit on the floor in front of the couch. I join him. The room dims and the TV lights up. On the screen, a lanky young man with a mop of curly hair feels questions from a curious reporter. It's an interesting movie. The protagonist is a college student who joins his best friend's startup. They make a social network that quickly takes over the country. However, midway through the film, it's revealed that the best friend is actually an alien who's using the social network as a way to harvest information about humanity. What? As the film winds down, I finish the final bite of the pizza. The protagonist just barely evades his best friend's ray gun and stabs it in the throat. What? <laughs> in the final few seconds, the protagonist staggers to the console, trying to prevent the information from being sent to the mothership, but he's too late. The film's final shot is of the console screen, eerily displaying transmission sent in big pixelated green letters. <sighs> Kalei gets up and flips on the lights. Mari turns off the TV. The hell was that? Playing sequel bait? I thought it was pretty good. Really ominous. It's a fitting metaphor for online privacy, isn't it? They couldn't stop the aliens because it can't be stopped. Once you use the internet, no matter how hard you try, your information is going to be collected and used against you. I'm really warming up to Kalei. I mean, Kalei has always been like, you know, a bundle of sunshine to me. But now he's like... Now he's like warming up to be like my ADHD bestie, like God, and like the depths that uh, Kale has as a character. I I absolutely love him. I absolutely love him. The five of us clean up, tossing the pizza boxes and cleaning the dishes. When we're done, we sit on the floor in a circle, chatting about the movie. Also, to be fair, Kale does most of the talking, and I'm pretty sure these silhouettes are from uh, Chattercap's previous games. Like, I am recognizing some of these silhouettes. What movies do you like, Lion? Ah, this question. Better not tell them what you really like. After all, if you tell them that your favorite series is an animated whodunit franchise for kids starring a detective dog... They'll think that you're weird and utterly childish. Again, guys, it's called anime. Like, please get with the times for the love of God. I brush aside guys' provocations. I already prepared. Yeah, I've watched most things. Yeah, I've been watching a lot of sci-fi stuff lately. My favorite is the Eradicator series. Oh, the one about the uh, shape-shifting aliens that take over humanity, right? Yeah, yeah. And main guy travels back in time to prevent humanity from making contact so that they don't take over. He's not the protagonist. The protagonist is a woman he's helping. He's the guy on the cover, though. The lay side. The guy on the cover is the villain. The villain! I really liked it. Especially the scene where the guy jumps into the vat of acid to save everyone else. That's the sequel! Why do you always get so hung up on the details, Kalei? Let up a little. Eradicator 2 is the best one. Eradicator Reborn is the best one. The villain wheels his pair of nunchucks that turn into machine guns. I liked Eradicator uh, 4, the one starring Holly Day. That reminds me of that other movie that we watched with Holly Day. The one where she has six months left to live, so she decides to go find her first love. That one was so good! Was crying at the end when she found her boyfriend's last love letter to her. Ending was kinda boring. Just say that you want to kill a robot to appear in the last 20 minutes of the movie, Asher. 60 years, 6 months was one of Holly's best performances. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that the director made the film with her in mind. <sighs> it was a crime that she didn't win the Golden Galaxy Award that year. As the conversation meanders away from the topics that I had started with, I fall silent. While Mari and Asher bicker about the sentimentality of the climax of 60 years, 6 months, Kalei leans over and asks if I've ever watched it. 
but all I can do is shake my head. Sometimes the conversation veers to movies that I have watched, and I scramble to think of something to say. Something interesting, that isn't too weird or offensive, but by the time I plan my words, the others are already talking about something completely different. Tick tock, tick tock. It's been so long since you last talked. It's just like class, isn't it? You're going to get a participation score of zero, you know? Oh my god. Oh, then again, like, considering you died when you were a child, I'm not surprised that you're acting like one, Geist. I open my mouth, trying to say something, but I soon close it again. Given up already? Oh, you've truly got an iron will. Why don't you go join the other furniture? I place my hands in my lap, focusing on wiping away some of the residual oil from my fingers. At this point, if I did say something... I just earned stares of befuddlement. Who is this stranger interrupting our conversation? Better not say anything. Yeah, I'll just stay quiet and wait for this get-together to end. As Naya and Mari discuss the relationship dynamics in the gothic romance film, the conversation slows down. Galea is listening intently to the argument, but Asher looks bored. He takes a swig from his beer before looking at me. Asher raises an eyebrow. He lying. Why are you so quiet? I freeze. I can't remember how many times I've been asked this question. What am I supposed to say? What do you say to that? Sorry, I'm quiet because I'm shy. I just don't like talking very much. I'm a bit tired. I'm not feeling it today. I don't know you guys that well, so it's hard for me to barge into the conversation. I'm actually kind of messed up in the head, and if I talk, you'll find out, so I'm not saying anything. There are a million answers, a million excuses, but I can never say anything. All I can do is offer a nervous laugh and say, <laughs> Yeah, I'm quiet. Naya and Mari slowly stop chatting and look at the two of us. Kalei is already staring. I shrink under their gazes. Guys leans closer, his cold breath tickling my ear. Oh no, it seems like they found out. How long did you think that you could hide it? Your real self. You pretended to be interesting. You pretended to be a person worth talking to. But you didn't even make it five minutes before showing them how boring you are. What will they think of Kalein now? He stuck his neck out for you, introducing you to all of his friends. Now what will they think? They might start to think that he's a miserable failure too because he likes someone like you. Sorry. I'm sorry for being so boring. Sorry for being such a killjoy. I'm sorry for ruining the mood. You've already ruined everything. You think that begging for forgiveness will help. You're just making things worse. Uh, why are you... Clay squeezes his beer can. The crinkling sound is loud in the relative silence. Maybe it's because they think hard about what they're going to say instead of saying any old thing. He prods Asher with his knee. And why are you so loud all the time, bro? Maybe you should learn to be a better listener. Asher's brow furrows, and his nostrils flare. He looks pissed. Now look at what you've done. You're ruining his friendships. Kalei is standing up for you. He's getting into a fight with his friend for you. Yeah, and that's sweet, I guess? I wrap my arms around myself, my knuckles whitening. I stare at my drink on the table, watching the condensation pool at the bottom. The same five words run around my head on repeat, screaming and screaming and screaming. I should not have come. I should not have come. I should not have come. I wish I wasn't here. I wish I was anywhere but here. Asher rolls his eyes before shoving Kalei in the shoulder. You don't want to talk. You're the loudest one of all of us. Kalei rolls his eyes in return, ignoring his friend's provocation. Anyway, speaking of gothic romances... What did you think about Scarlet Tears? You mentioned that was one of your favorites from last year. We watched that a couple weeks ago. Kalei smoothly transitions the conversation to a film that I've watched. I managed to get in a few sentences, although it doesn't take too long for the conversation to veer in the direction I couldn't keep up with. However, whenever he notices, Kalei brings me back into the fold with an easy question. Asher remains relatively silent, his arms are crossed, and his eyes are narrow into a pointed glare aimed straight at Kalei. The other boy doesn't stop sulking until we split up for the evening, with everyone returning to their respective dorm rooms. I'm the only one who lives in a separate building. Kalei offers to walk me back. When we're outside, I cross my arms, 
shielding my body from the chill. I feel strangely nauseous and oddly vulnerable in a way I can't explain, as if someone cut a hole in my chest, left it open so that everyone could peer inside. Clay scratches his nose. He looks around awkwardly before turning to face me. I'm sorry. For what? They, um, said some pretty insensitive stuff to you. They're not usually like that. They were only like that because you were there. You made everything awkward. I'll make sure they're on their best behavior next time. Don't worry. There won't be a next time. Not after you messed everything up so badly. Ah, screw up, guys. I'm really glad that you came. He's lying. They always lie. He's just trying to... We all like movies, but sometimes it feels like I'm the only one who takes him seriously, you know? They're always joking around about how bad the dialogue is or how hot the actors are. Whenever I want to talk about the story or the characters, they brush me off. Even when they don't, you can tell they don't want to talk, you know? That's interesting or, wow, you thought about it a lot. Sometimes I, I feel like a weirdo. Like I don't belong. Oh, my big baby, my big puppy of a man, God. So it was really nice having you there. It seems like we're on the same wavelength. Ah! He might be lying, placating me with soothing words, but he seems sincere. I... I feel the same way. I really like talking to you, too. I mumbled the words, barely able to get them out. Inwardly, I curse. I sound so awkward. What if Kali thinks that I'm lying or being insincere? Feels like you listen to me. You really listen. I wanted to thank you for that. Oh, he's so cute! <laughs> Guilt bubbles in my stomach. I want to protest. That's wrong. I'm not listening. Not really. I'm just so wrapped up in my own thoughts all the time that I don't speak. In reality, I'm a selfish jerk who's always obsessing about myself. I don't listen to you because my head... My thoughts are constantly screaming in my head. But when I look at Kali, his sunny smile erodes my doubts. He's genuinely grateful towards me. Even if it was accidental, I did something for him that he appreciates. I made him feel heard. I guess I did a good thing? I look around. Geist is gone. We arrive at my dorm building. Thanks for inviting me. I had fun. When I return to my room, the guilt in my stomach has morphed into something else. A strange mixture of emotions. One that I can't easily define. Guilt, nervousness, humiliation, gratitude, and something almost like pride? Around a month has passed since Calais invited me to meet his friends. I lounge on my bed, scrolling through my feed. Is it Kali? I scan my notifications. It's not. Just say I got an email. And we got a package, so hey, let's just skip ahead. Alright, time to push Geist away. Bye, Geist! Geist's touch fills me with revulsion, resentment, and anger. I shove him away. He stumbles backward, hitting his head against my desk. He rubs the back of his head, glaring at me. Everyone hates you? It seems like the only one who hates me is you, Geist. Geist's eyes widen. His eyes are brimming with emotion that I can't quite describe. It almost looks like betrayal. I... I don't hate you. I love you. I care about you more than anyone else. You're my entire world. I exist for you. Ha! You love me? When you spend all day telling me how worthless, disgusting, and unlovable I am, when you do nothing but beat me down, grinding me into dust so that you can pick up the pieces? I don't know what that is, but it's definitely not love. The floodgates are open now. I blink quickly, trying not to let the tears flow out of my eyes as the words flow out of my mouth. Why? What's your game, huh? You want me to feel small and laughable and hopeless so that I never feel confident enough to leave you? So that I'll always need you? Guys opens his mouth before closing it again. He tries to speak a couple more times before he finally finds the words. I'm just being honest with you. I don't want you to get hurt. Not when you're this fragile. Not when the slightest push will break you into a thousand pieces. You're the only one who's hurting me! I, 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 I just wanted to help. 
You're not helping. You've never helped. The tears are gushing out now. Warm droplets caressing my cheeks. All you do is make me so stressed that I'm terrified to do anything. Boxing me into a prison of my own thoughts so that I can't step out of it. Trying to alienate me from the people around me. You liar. Uh, not a liar. But you are. Calais hates me when every single thing that he has done has communicated the opposite. He says that he likes to talk to me. He invites me to hang out. He wants me to meet his friends. And yet, every single time, you tell me that he's pretending that he actually hated me all along. What kind of crazy hopes do you have to jump through to believe that he hates me after all that? What are you, some kind of mind reader to be able to tell what he's really feeling? No. But I, I just know. Besides, even if he doesn't hate you now, he'll hate you eventually. It's just a matter of time. And if something like that happens later and he tells me that he hates me, so what? I'll move on. I'll live. It won't be the end of the world. Make new friends. Form new relationships. But if I'm always too scared... If I never reach out, then I'll never form bonds with anyone. I'll just continue floating listlessly through life, blindly following wherever you decide to take me. I might get hurt. That's okay. It happens. I don't want to spend my life avoiding the things I'm afraid of. I want to spend it doing the things I actually want to do. What do you want to do? I don't need to think about my answer. I want to be Kalei's friend. Guys looks down at the phone, guilt marring his features. He lifts his eyes to meet mine. I stare back, unwavering. He extends the phone to me. <sighs> Alright. Good luck. I hesitate, thinking that this might be a trick before accepting the device. It's still displaying Kalei's conversation on TriMessage. I bite my lip and send my message quickly, trying not to overthink it. Are you interested in watching a movie with me? I just got my hands on Young Detective Dog, and I thought you might want to see it. My phone buzzes immediately. Yes! I really wanted to see it. Right now? Right now? I want my tears from my eyes. I'm really in no state to see him right now. I pause before sending the next message. I've uh, got a few things to do right now, but maybe in a couple of hours. I'll be there. Can't wait. I look up. Guys, just gone. Hey! He sounds a little different from normal. Almost overly enthusiastic. He brandishes a plastic bag filled to the brim with different snacks. Whoa! He just had these lying around? Oh no, I ran to the store really quick. I didn't know what you liked, so I got a bunch of stuff. Oh, he loved Kalei. He rummages through the bag. Oops, I forgot drinks. I laugh. We're in my room. Why are you the one trying to provide everything? He smiles awkwardly. You're right. Uh, that's kind of weird, isn't it? <laughs> I guess I got a little excited and didn't think too much. We laugh together before settling on the rug. I prop my laptop on my desk chair. I plug in my DVD player before carefully inserting the Detective Dark disc. The movie starts with a close-up of a dingy city street. Several pairs of feet pass by, splashing through the muddy puddles strewn over the cement. Calais opens a carton of cookies. He holds the box open for me. I take one, savoring the cream-filled sandwiches between two chocolate biscuits. He also opens a bag of spicy chips and sets it on the ground between us. The camera zooms in, focusing on an alleyway in the background. A dirty cardboard box comes into view. A small puppy, his fur matted with dirt and blood, lies in the box. I'm Doc. In the future, I'll be Detective Doc. But not now. Now, I'm just a poor, orphan dog. We quickly become completely enthralled by the film. The animation is Definitely dated, but the voice acting performances and the writing are mesmerizing. 
The plot is much darker than other entries in the Detective Dark series, following Dark as he is falsely accused of stealing a rich cat's pearls. On screen, we watch Dark's interrogation. Uh, Dark stays quiet as the policeman tries to emotionally manipulate him, promising a warm bed and food if Dark fesses up. I fumble a chip out of the bag, enjoying the spicy sweetness. I reach towards the bag again when Kale's fingers ghost over the back of my hand. I freeze. S sorry. He jerks his hand away, awkwardly readjusting his hat. His ears are ripped. What hat? I'm a little nervous. Kiss, 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 kiss. I reach over and place my hand on his, squeeze again. Then I turn towards him. I hover in front of Kalei's face, just long enough that he can sense my intentions. His eyes widen, but he doesn't pull away. I press my lips against his. It's only for a moment, but his skin is warm and soft against mine. I pull away just as quickly, burying my face in my hands. Somehow, I had gone drunk on chocolate, cookies, spicy chips, and orphaned animated dogs. Kalei turns away from me. I want to scream! I ruined it. Good going, Lion. The second that you tell guys to get lost, you decide to act like a creep and pervert. Good job! <laughs> I could have really said Jerk's intervention if I had known I was going to do something this stupid. Now Kalei really won't want to be friends anymore. And he'll feel too awkward to stop the movie, so now he's going to be stuck here with a deviant. Kalei tentatively reaches his hands out. He places it over mine, interlacing our fingers. He... He squeezes my hand. Ah! Uh, what's up with that? I'm not gonna say anything about the hand. Hands are hard. After our introductory computer science class ended, and the new semester started, Kalei and I started to officially date. We often spend our evenings together and go out on the weekends. Nowadays, I invite him out to hang out as often as he invites me. Our unspoken rule is that whoever does the inviting gets to choose the movie. I've gotten to know Kalei's friends better too. Mari is a sweet girl who is always caring for others like a mother hen. Naya is level-headed and unflappable, with a penchant for sarcasm. Even Asher isn't a bad guy once you get to know him. He has a tendency to blurt out whatever's on his mind, and he's a little immature, but he's genuinely caring and has his moments. I find myself striking up conversations with other classmates too. We don't become fast friends, but we exchange a few friendly words. Sometimes the interactions aren't as smooth as butter, and sometimes they're as rough as sliding across sandpaper. But that's okay. I feel myself changing, little by little. That man didn't vanish completely. But whenever he tries to drown my ears in nervous prophecies, I don't respond. It's difficult to ignore him, but he's quieter now, less insistent. His rhetoric has changed too. He no longer speaks exclusively in apocalyptic foretellings. Sometimes he watches me open up my fourth cup of instant noodles of the week and says, That much sodium can't be good for you. Why not cook something? When I'm on the couch, scrolling mindlessly through social media, he sits next to me and leans to my ear and whispers, Going for a walk would be better for you than lazing at home, wouldn't it? As I sit at my desk browsing through online shopping portals, he sidles up behind me and shuts my laptop, saying, You know you don't have room for frivolous purchases in the budget right now. His tongue hasn't lost its edge, but those lectures only bring me mild annoyance, not fear. Sometimes I actually take his advice, and sometimes I tell him no. On the occasion, he falls back into old habits, reciting old lines. They don't like you. Everyone hates you. You do nothing but ruin everything. But he says them less and less with each passing day. There is a man that follows me. He's always watching, and sometimes he whispers in my ear. I wonder if he'll ever go away. He probably won't. And that's alright. Ah, oh, that was an absolutely amazing story. God damn. Also, um, there's a little... Um, I didn't show you guys this before, or I didn't put enough emphasis on this, but there's a little message from the developer here. For anyone who has mental health struggles, know that you're not alone. I hope that you all have more days where guys is a little quieter than usual. But anyway, 
that was mine, mine, mine. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys do want to play this for yourselves, link to the game will be in the description below. I I did enjoy the story. I really, really enjoyed the story. Shattercap really did a great job, as usual. Like, holy frick. I don't understand how Shattercap keeps coming up with visual novels of this quality. It is... They are always so good. And I know I've not played uh, Canal yet. I am planning to play that sometime soon. But in the meantime, okay... Thank you all so much for watching. Hope you all have a lovely rest of the day. And as always, I'll be seeing you in the next video. This is Lion, signing off. Ciao.